Do you prefer talking on the phone? I'll have you raise your hand here in a second. Or, or texting. Like we, if you get to choose, you know, now we probably all do a little bit of both. But if you're like, I text is a necessity, but I prefer to just talk on the phone. You raise your hand. All right. And you're better off that you say, nah, I'm, I just would rather text. I don't really want to talk on the phone. I never check my voicemail. Okay, interesting. That's, that's kind of close to 50-50. Um, not necessarily, just, <laughs> just in general. Just in general. <laughs> that's right. You never, yeah, it does depend who's on the other end of the call. Uh, bless God for call wait, uh, not call waiting, caller ID, right? Because I, I, some of you may not, I don't know if there's people, you're gonna, but it's like, you know, there was a time when the phone rang and you didn't know who was on the other end until you picked it up and said hello. Another uh, thing behind that, how many of you are familiar with the term cold calling? Do you know what that is? So if you don't know, I actually, uh, early in my ministry career, uh, had, uh, I basically... I made like $500 a month, okay, in ministry. So I had to have, I was bivocational. I had to have another job. And that other job, as soon as I got out of school, was uh, selling insurance. And I lived in Southern Illinois, where I'm from. My office was in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, hour and 40-minute commute to the office. Yuck, right? But my territory went from Fairfield, Illinois, all the way to Arkansas, uh, not quite to St. I mean, it was, it was a big territory. But we were required two days out of the week to be in the office in Cape Girardeau and make cold calls in order to set appointments for the other days of the week, which then we could just, and we could organize that how we wanted and set appointments, you know, we'd try to set them together so I wasn't traveling all over. But there were days when I would have to make 300 plus cold calls. And if you're not, I know most of you said you were, but if you're not familiar, cold call basically means telemarketing. Like I'm, I'm calling a list of people who in some way, in my case, they had uh, shown interest in getting more information about a particular insurance product. Um, but you know how it is. It's like you say, I'm interested. You think they're going to mail you a packet. You're not expecting a salesperson to call. So it's a cold call because it's like that person's not expecting my call. We don't have an appointment. I'm just burning through it. And as you can imagine, you have to do 300 phone calls, and, and the goal was like, I'm trying to get like 10 appointments. Because it's like, people don't answer, they answer and then they hang up. Uh, I loved, if uh, you guys are familiar with Seinfeld, have, do, do you remember this bit? The uh, telemarketer calls, and, and Jerry's kind of going back and forth with him. He's like, well, uh, I'm actually on my way out. You're like, Let, can I get your, your, your home number and I'll, I'll call you later when I have more time? Oh, no, we don't, we, don't, we don't do that, you know. Oh, you want to be called at home? He's like, now you know how I feel. Click. <laughs> right? So I would do these cold calls to set these appointments, and it's like, it just wears you out, right? Now, uh, that has nothing to do with texting. I couldn't text those people, but, but my point is... Sometimes, we're, we're, I'm going to tie this in more as we go, but to begin to, to connect it for you, our life with Jesus, and we're going to read some things here in the book of Acts, is not a life of cold calling. Jesus is making appointments for us. He's setting things up, and we're going to explore more about what that looks like as we go. But I just want to start with that place, because especially when we start talking about sharing our faith or praying for people or doing the types of things that we describe kingdom people do, we often are resistant because we think of it as cold calling. Well, I'm going to be that awkward person who's walking into an unwanted situation or trying to give somebody something they don't want. And that can happen. I'm not saying that that's an impossibility. But I think if we tuned in to what God is doing, he's actually wanting to set us up. He's actually wanting to set those appointments for us. And that's what we're going to explore today. We're going to jump in. There's, there's a lot of scripture, and I, I'm, I'm, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to start right at the beginning, Acts chapter 2. We were in Acts 1 last week. And this is the story of when the Holy Spirit comes. Um, and we're going to circle back to this. We celebrate Pentecost coming up in a few weeks. 
Um, but we're going to go ahead and touch on it now. Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. So I just want to pause here. First of all, this event, if you will, uh, was significant enough to get people's attention, right? It's like they, this sound that, that came from this place was significant enough that, that they came running to find out what was going on. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Now, we're not going to go through and, and pronounce all the different funny names of places of where people are from. But the point is, there's people from all over, and it ends even saying uh, Cretans and Arabs. And, and so I just want to paint this picture. This is a diverse crowd. It's not just people from like a couple neighborhoods in Jerusalem. These are distinctly different people groups with, with very different, not just dialects, but languages and customs and realities like the diversity is, is just incredible. And you go down to the middle of verse 11, it says, And we he all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed, and they asked each other, What can this mean? Well, this is probably a familiar verse. It said, Others in the crowd ridiculed, saying, Oh, they're just drunk. That's all. You know. Peter then steps forward. This is in verse 14, and then we're going we're gonna to pause again here in a minute. But Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jer Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Now, we're going to stop there before we go on to what he, he says next. The first comment that I want to make is, because I just I missed this early on, right? You know, you, you think he's just making a comment. You know, oh, it, it's too early. Like, that's not culturally acceptable that you would, that you would drink this early in the morning. You have to understand the, the process of the, the type of wine that they had. It, it, takes a, it would take a lot of volume of, of this alcohol to get drunk enough to behave that way. And what he is saying, he's trying to set things straight because how many of you have seen something and it's like you have no context for it, you have no bo so you struggle with, well, how do I categorize this? This is that type of event. And so they're struggling with how to explain this. And what he's saying is not just, oh, it's, it's taboo. They, they, they wouldn't drink this early. He's saying it's, there's not even physically been enough time. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. They've not been here long enough to have consumed the amount of alcohol it would take for them to behave this way. And, and the way he says this, and he says it with such authority, it, like, it gets the people's attention. They're like, what? oh, yeah, I guess that's right. That I. That doesn't really make sense. And he goes on and he says in verse 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women, they will prophesy. And, and he continues on. But I want to remind you, if we go back, if you remember the story of Jesus when he went into the temple and, and he read the scroll and he says, and this day, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the same type of thing. He's preaching this because he's a giving an explanation to what has happened. And what he's saying is the last days have begun. He's referencing this passage from Joel where it says in the last days, this is what God will do. And Peter is saying, this is what you're seeing. 
This is the fulfillment of what was prophesied. The last days have begun. Okay, I want to go on and I want to work through some of these and then then we'll begin to tie it all together and get some application. Let's go to verse 22. Verse 22, this is just after Peter finishes that that initial uh, sermon. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in his grip. We're going to pause there again. You notice that phrase? God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out. See, some people can read this story of what happened to the apostles in this upper room when the Holy Spirit came and think, we put the apostles up on a pet. Oh, these were the most anointed people. They were doing, you know, constant, deep worship and prayer. They, they, just, they, they, they brought the Holy Spirit by their high level of holiness and anointing. And I just don't think that's the picture of what was really happening. I don't think that, that I think it was Jesus' prearranged plan. In other words, he set them up. If you go back to Matthew 28, where we read when Jesus ascended and he promised that I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going back to the Father and the one who comes after me, the Holy Spirit, it's like, again, it's a fulfillment of a promise. It's a prearranged plan. It's a setup, right? We need to realize that, that there's something in that for us, that we don't have to try to cajole God into doing something. We actually can just pray and ask him to set us up. We don't have to cold call. We don't have to walk into things blind. God wants to set us up. Verse 29, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself. Just to jump back. If you want to read the the preceding part, it it references things that David said about him. David was pointing towards the future, King David, in, in this passage that's referenced. And so now he's addressing that. Dear brothers, you can be sure the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself because he died and was buried and his tomb is here still among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's descendants, and as we know, Jesus was a descendant of King David, would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. I just want to point out a few more things from this story. So this this crowd of people that is watching all of this unfold, that's having trouble accurately connecting with what's actually happening, right? They're coming up with uh, trying to grapple with ways to categorize what's happening, which is the accusation, well, these people are drunk or, or whatever. For all of us, Spiritual blindness and hard hearts prevent us from seeing his work. You see, the, these incredible things that we just read about happened right in front of these people. They were firsthand eyewitnesses, and yet they didn't quite get it. They didn't understand. And this can be true for all of us. We can have spiritual blindness and we can have hard hearts that prevent us from seeing the work that God is doing. And seeing the ways that we can participate in the work that God is doing. Seeing the ways that he sets us up to participate without having to cold call. You see, just as David was looking towards the future when he 
prophesied this coming Messiah, God is always working towards the future. Now, there's two key phrases in there. One, he's always working, right? Like, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't slumber, he doesn't rest. He is always working. When, uh, when Jesus gets separated from his parents, right, if you know this story, and he's in the temple, and basically they're in the caravan going down the road, and they realize he's not there. And once they come back and they find him, you know, his comment, which I'm like, I don't know, I couldn't speak to my mama this way, but it's a different culture, a different time. You know, well, don't you know I must be about my father's business? We can identify with that. The father is always working, and he's inviting us to be about that business, but he doesn't have to take a break. He doesn't have to go on vacation, right? He is always working, but he is working towards the future. I explained this before how uh, the ancient people of God before the cross were looking forward to uh, the longing of the Messiah coming. And I talked about us looking back in relation to the cross and we can see what was finished, but that reality is what enables us to live towards the future. We are looking back to the cross, but we're not living that direction right? We're not living purely out of the past and, and just trying to learn lots of facts about what Jesus did and what happened. We're trying to live towards the future of what God is doing on the earth now and what future hope he has called us to. I don't know, for some reason in my mind, this is the direction because I, I have like this continuum or this line graph spectrum in my mind. And it's like, for whatever reason, this, this is always towards the future, and this is towards the past. I, it probably doesn't matter to any of you, but um, I tend to reference this direction when I'm talking about heaven, okay? God is always working towards that future, and we know, we, we, again, we can miss it and skip so far forward that we think living towards the future is focusing on what happens when we die and the realities of heaven. And those things are true and real, more real than you can imagine. And I don't think that it's unprofitable at times to maybe just ponder what some of that might look like, what some of that reality might include. But the future that we're living towards is, again, just the next step. God, God has a setup for what happens when you go out to the parking lot and leave and go to lunch today. God has a setup for what happens when you walk in the doors of work tomorrow. Now, we're not talking about uh, ignoring all of your responsibilities and solely focusing. I like to say we can, ch we can, I almost said that totally wrong. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? Maybe, maybe some of us can't, I don't know. <laughs> we can live our lives and do the things that we're going to do while simultaneously also be living towards the future and looking for how God might be setting us up, for how God might be prearranging uh, people that we would bump into. If you remember back, I, I love just how this uh, gave me a visual picture for this reality. Of all the people in our area, statistic. Uh, statistical research would tell us that about, uh, at any given time, 3% of the population uh, have God questions. That, uh, saying they have God questions means there's a level of, of openness. They're not antagonistic. Uh, they're maybe in some way, shape, or form searching or seeking, but there's a level of openness, and they have questions that, that they're seeking answers for. And we know the answer is, is carried through us in Jesus. But my point is, if you just think about that, and, and to, uh, to remind you of the visualization, in our context, that means that's enough people to fill the Peoria Civic Center, are just wandering around, uh, I, I could even say ripe, open, ready. And, and what... Spirit-led life looks like is looking for those setups. So we might think, you know, cold calling is just every person I run into, I, I'm, I'm, you know, 
I'm slamming the Bible in their face. I don't know, that might not be the right phrase, but that's cold calling. What Jesus is saying, there are people that are ripe. There are people that are ready. There are people that are open, and I want to set you up to interface with those people. Now, when I describe it that way, I think, I hope, that actually means that we can all do it, right? We can move out from underneath this idea that, you know, well, that's for the the pastors and the preachers and the leaders. See, the whole idea of life in the time from the book of Acts is looking for what God is doing. This is what they did. They See, that they weren't, in one way, they weren't like more special people than we are. They weren't more anointed. Because that's where we, we will give an excuse. Well, I can't do that stuff because I, I don't carry that anointing. I, I'm, not, I'm not gifted in that way. These were ordinary people led and empowered by the Spirit of God being set up being set up by God to interface with the people. So, so you might even say it this way. Now, I, I'm not going to attach the, the statistics to it because I, I didn't do the math. I don't know the numbers. I do know that the population of, of Jerusalem at that time was probably eighty to 90,000 people, but they had swelled because it's sort of people that had come in from other places. So you could probably work out the math and say, you know, this crowd of people that had gathered and the ones that if we go on... Uh, if you read the rest of chapter 2 where the church is started, uh, he preaches again and it says 3,000 were added to the church that day. That's that pile of people that had God questions, right? It's the people that, that were open, that were ready. And it's like God arranged this series of events as a setup. And I don't know if we understand how that is revealing the Father's heart. The Father's heart is 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 for everyone, but he sees and he knows where people are at, again, on that, on that spectrum of openness, readiness, you know, and it's like he wants to give us some low-hanging fruit. It doesn't mean there's not hard cases. It doesn't mean there aren't people that say no or hang up the phone on you or slam the door in your face. I mean, I, I've had those realities, but God wants to set us up. He has that promise. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit. And for the disciples, he was saying, this is being fulfilled today. But it wasn't the end. See, we're still living in the last days. You think, well, how can that be? It's been a couple thousand years. Well, first of all, God operates outside of the space-time continuum, if you will. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to try to explain that because that, that's above my pay grade. But the reality is we are living in the last days. Now, I'm not talking about some Nostradamus prediction that in the year 2027, you know, this. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the reality that Jesus came and inaugurated the kingdom. In other words, He started the process of the kingdom of heaven breaking in to the present kingdom of darkness here on the earth. And then he left and he said, I'm going to send my spirit so that you all can continue this ministry, so that you can continue being about the Father's business and doing the things that he's doing. And one day I'm going to come back and I'll help you wrap it all up and I will consummate all things. My kingdom will come in its fullness and all things will be set right. We live in that in-between. We have a little pamphlet out on the wall uh, that if you've ever looked at, it's about the kingdom of God, but on the back it has this diagram and I I didn't pull it up for the guys to put on the screen today, Um, but ask me about it sometime. Because it it visually diagrams this reality of how we are living in the time between the times. And that's what was initiated with Jesus, was the time between the times. We are living in the tension between two kingdoms. Just as we read in the crucifixion and resurrection story, the kingdom of darkness has been defeated. He has no more feet. No, I'm sorry. Never mind. 
The kingdom of darkness has been defeated. He has been dealt with. It has not been fully enforced, right? Like, because we still live with the with the, the reality of bumping into those things that you know, stealing, killing, destroying, sickness, disease, death. We we still have those realities present. But Jesus has promised, my kingdom will overcome. And we are in that process. And, and you can use this language of saying we're in a battle. That is true. But one important distinction I would make, if you want to use the battle language, that we are living in a battle, and it is a spiritual battle. I'll put that qualifier on it too. We are not in a battle fighting for victory. We are in a battle fighting from victory. Victory has been accomplished. It's no longer any question about what things are going to look like at the end, but the enemy encampment has not been fully pushed off the map yet. And the works of the enemy, the effects, have not been fully corrected yet. But we are working, we are living from victory. And so I'm going back to that that timeline thing when I talked about we're looking back towards the cross, but we're living towards the future. The looking back part is where we see the victory, right? The cross accomplished what was necessary for me to have victory, and I'm living towards the time when Jesus comes and settles it. When all the works of the devil will be ultimately destroyed. But the beautiful thing is that even in the in-between, we're invited to participate in the ministry of Jesus, which is going about destroying the works of the devil. He doesn't have the right and the authority to continue these things unchecked. And Jesus said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on my kids. And that's going to give them the power and the authority to go about continuing this ministry of destroying the works of the devil. Now let's get real practical because that's kind of religious language. What does it look like to destroy the works of the devil? It looks like me uh, walking side by side in, in conversation with someone who's hopelessly addicted to drugs. And by the power of prayer, by the miraculous power of Jesus, seeing that addiction power broken. And I've, I've seen that. I have seen God sober people from decades of addiction in an instant. And not, not sobered up for the moment and then they relapse next week. I'm talking about like done. And I'm not claiming that happens every time. But, but when the power of the kingdom breaks in, I have seen that reality play out. The, the power of God is capable of doing that. And that's destroying the works of the devil. The works of the devil through addiction are to get people bound, to get them to lose touch with hope, to feel, you know, I come from generations of people who have lived like this and I've just accepted this is who I am and this is how I'm going to live. And then the kingdom of God breaks in and says, no, sorry, Mike, (laughs) it doesn't have to be that way. There's hope. There's a different way. There's a new power in operation that's actually stronger than the power of your addiction. That's what it can look like. That's what it can look like. And we can participate in it. And, and, you know, then we might slide right back. Yeah, but I'm, I, you know, I, I can do that kind of, I don't have that gift. God wants to set you up. All he wants from you is to a willing yes. Live your yes towards the future. Be willing. Be open. Allow him to lead you, and he will do the work. He will do the work. God is always working towards the future. When we came, uh, I'm saying we, uh, based on the assumption for most of us here, at some point in the past, we came towards Jesus. We established a relationship 
that's the li- religious language would be, we received salvation. Uh, for many of us, we might have a particular point on the calendar where we can say that happened. For some of us, it may have been more gradual. It may have not been uh, as definable as, but, but we've entered into this relationship with Jesus. And we're, we're, we're moving along. We're working. We're, we're doing this thing. The process of that relationship is transforming us into the future. Now, again, you can go all the way out, and, and it's helping us start to look more like Jesus, getting in touch with heavenly things, because that's where we're going to spend eternity, but also in the near term. We read these stories that Jesus went from town to town preaching. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody needs to become a preacher or an evangelist. But everyone, everyone can carry the message of the gospel. And, and do you remember there where it said, I, I probably can't find it real quick, but it said that, that it, they con- God confirmed Jesus with these works of power and these signs and wonders. And that promise applies to us. When the gospel reality of the kingdom of God is brought forth, God will back it up with his power and his purposes. That's the setup. If you listen and look, what, Father, what are you doing? Who, you, and it can be as simple as this. I'm just trying to always look. Who is God drawing my attention to? It can be that simple. I might be grocery shopping, and, and if you know me, I'm a little bit of an introvert. I'm not the, you know, I don't want to talk to everybody in the grocery store, right? So it's like, I'm, I'm, and I'll even go further than that. When I do the grocery shopping, I call it airstrikes. I will walk, like, now, I don't particularly love shopping at Walmart, but I used to work there, and so this illustration helps. All Walmarts typically have, you know, the big main wide aisle, and it goes in a square through the store. We work there. We call that the racetrack. And like during shift change, you know, I was a manager, and so I would walk with the manager, come in, we would walk the racetrack, you know, to point, hey, you know, this needs done, or we did this last night, or, or whatever. When I grocery shop, I still, I will walk the racetrack, and I will only go into the aisles in an airstrike. Okay, that's the rice aisle. I need one bag of white rice. Get it back out to the racetrack. Right? Okay? So that, that's how I grocery shop. This is what it can be like. Let's use that same example. I'm walking through Walmart. I'm buying my groceries. I'm being, that's the natural part of Natural Supernatural is we just still do life. Like we still need to buy groceries and go to school and go to work and do all of that. And I'm going along, and for some reason I look down this aisle, and, oh, no, I don't need anything in that aisle. And then my eye just catches somebody, and for some reason they just, I don't know, they just stuck out to me. They caught my attention. That might be a God thing. That might be a setup. And so I'm not perfect at this, but I'm learning and trying to train myself to follow those things, to find out, God, what are you doing? Am I seeing something that you're seeing? Is this, is this a setup? And sometimes that'll be followed by, hey, that person's got some pain in their back that, you know, they were in a car accident like 10 years ago. And they've just, it didn't heal right. And it's just never been right since. And so I might walk up to that person and say, and I, I will give this disclaimer. Hey, this might be really weird, but I'm practicing and learning how to hear from God. And I think he just told me that you were in a car accident 10 years ago. And, you, you know, and, and I ask them, sometimes they say, nope. And I say, I'm still practicing. This was a flop. Can I just pray and bless you? I, for whatever reason, I may have got that wrong because I'm still learning and growing, but some reason you still got my attention. Can I just pray and bless you? But sometimes they say, oh my gosh, how do you know that? Well, God told me, and I'm trying to learn how to listen to him. And I think he told me because he wants to do something about it. And I'll just simply ask them, is it okay? Can I pray for you? It'll just take 30 seconds. And depending on who it is, when, is it okay if I, if I put my hand on? And if they say no, I don't. I don't have to lay hands, right? That's the, I, I want to, but I don't have to. And I might just say, Jesus, 
thank you for Sue, whoever, I don't know. Thank you for healing power. Set this right so that she will know that you love her and that you want a relationship with her. I love putting that in prayers with people that I don't know. Because I don't, I don't start with a, with a Romans Road discourse, you know, and, and I, they don't have to be a Christian for God to heal them, right? So I just start with, God set this right, but I love throwing them in there so they will know that you love them and want a relationship with them. And then I'm observing, right? I'm looking and seeing, Father, what are you doing? Is there a visible reaction? Do I see the whole? And then you just, you just follow that and you pray until they're done or the Spirit's done, right? And it doesn't have to be, again, you know, if you're in Walmart, now if you're in the checkout line, it has to really be quick, right? But if you're in the bread aisle, you know, you might have a little bit more time. I want to do a better job of telling these kinds of stories. And I'm not just talking about me. This is something that's been on my mind, and we're trying to figure out how do we collect and curate these I mean, now this was a made-up example, but I've done things exactly like this. I just didn't dial up a particular story. We want to collect these stories because it encourages all of us that it's possible. It gives us faith that God does break in and do stuff, but it also helps us know everybody can do it, right? So if we take away anything from this section of Acts chapter 2 today, it's looking for what God is doing, looking for the setup, because he's always working.